Here we are in an early JK. I'm guessing this is a 9. 2009 is the year that they added that net to the lower column or console. This is an LS3 with a 6L80. And what more can I say that I haven't already said? It's an awesome combination. We've done a lot of them. This one's no different. It's got a lot of bottom end torque. It's got the proper sound. Yet. It's a V8. So since we've done these LS3 so many times before, it might be better to talk about where we're going with the LS swap. And this is really a big deal for us because I think we've gone from basically one of the more complicated swaps of the market to probably the easiest. And I'm not just including LS swaps, I'm including Hemis too. When we first started doing this eight years ago, it was very complex. We had to figure out how to make the air conditioning work, ESP, dash gauges, etc. And we did it by interfacing. Over the years and hundreds and hundreds of swaps, we've learned a lot. We are now at a point where we're going to offer a easy install package. And this is not only going to help us here in-house, but it's going to help shops, other shops, and guys in their garage. Our goal for the Easy Swap Kit is to make this the easiest V8 swap in a JK possible. No parts to be modified. So what is Easy Install about? Well, it's about you getting your engine in, your JK, with the least amount of time, grief, and fabrication labor hours. So we're minimizing the fabrication to an absolute minimum. We're minimizing the wiring to an absolute minimum. And here's the exciting part. We're using all OE parts. We're using OE harnesses that are plug and play, which means if you went to the dealer and you purchased a factory harness off the shelf, you could put it in your swap. If you got a lift out from a wrecking yard and it has a harness on it, you're going to plug it into our small integration harness and you're on the road. We're going to make this compliant, which means not only is the harness compliant because it's OE, and that's really a big deal because the heart of any swap is really the harness and the manufacturers spend a lot of time and money to ensure the quality of these harnesses. They're thoroughly tested. Every circuit is designed with a specific gauge of wire to carry the current circuit protection, ground distribution, and we're going to maintain all that. And we're going to maintain it while being plug and play. If you want the maximum functionality, reliability, emissions compliance, etc. We're staying with factory GM computers and calibrations. What that means is you can't take a 5.3 tune and expect to run a 6.0 or a 6.2 properly from it. When you flash an ECM with GM TIS, Technical Information System or SPS Service Programming, what you're doing is you're setting up the framework for your engine. And in that framework is airflow calculation, throttle actuator control. There's actually a separate module inside of the E38 ECM, the TAC module. You guys might remember in the Gen 3 engines, the TAC module was on the firewall and it was susceptible to water and heat, etc. Well, they put it inside the E38. And when you flash your calibration into that E38 for, let's say, a 6 liter, that calibration or the operating system is setting up all the background embedded programming, which is the liters of the engine versus airflow, the throttle opening. And if you, you can mess with throttle opening in the tune, but if you don't know what you're doing, you can brick your computer. Basically, you need to start off with the right tune. To start off with the wrong tune and then try to correct it to run right, yeah, you can probably do it but you're just missing so many things. The mode 6 data is not going to be correct for emissions. You're not going to be emissions compliant. There's probably going to be some drivability issues, um, whether it's hesitation, surges, rough idle, fuel trims. It's just best to go with what GM designed. And in states like California right now, and I'm pretty sure in the future other states are going to go to the same, the same inspection, you need to take your vehicle to a manufacturer, the manufacturer, and have them certify the tune. So if you go in and you don't have the right operating system and calibration, let's say you you put a, a supercharger on it and it doesn't have an EO, you're not going to pass. If you have a Hemi with a 3.6 VIN number and computer and you patched a Hemi calibration in, you're not going to pass. If you had a 5.3 VIN number and a 6.0 tune, you're not going to pass. It, it goes beyond just 
logic, which is run the tune for your engine. AC line, power steering lines, with our billet brackets that bolt right on, you're gonna put these right back. So a guy in his garage can possibly do a swap over a week or even a weekend with enough diligence without sending us any parts. Remain not only compliant, but know that you have the right calibrations and you have the right operating systems and you have the right modules so that you have the highest chance of success to make this thing work. There's nothing worse than getting a swap together and then have drivability issues and then you got to take it to a dyno tuner or you got to take it to a local shop to figure out why your fuel trims are off. So we're trying to minimize that and nothing's a hundred percent but we can give you the best shot possible and I will say we invented the LSJK swap, the functional swap, many many years ago and it was a complicated swap. We've come full circle now and have incorporated technologies that essentially are going to make this LS swap possibly the easiest JKV8 swap on the market. When you don't have to modify anything, you're going to have full power distribution, full ground distribution, OE computers. In this way, you can literally do the entire swap in your garage without outsourcing any of the labor or work. When you're done with the swap, you're going to be able to have this service by GM. You're going to be able to have this diagnosed by GM or, or an independent that does GM work. If you need a new harness, go to the dealer, you buy a new harness. You need diagnostics, the color of the wires, the codes, the trouble charts. It's all going to be there. Mode 6 data, emissions data, enhanced digital trouble codes, monitoring, all going to be there. So where are we going with this? Eight years ago, we spent a lot of time putting an LS and a JK because we felt it was the best powertrain. Size, weight, cooling, power delivery. We were the only ones that were properly integrating the JK with an LS engine and it wasn't easy. Now we did it with analog and digital signals, which was quite complex, but we did it. Years later, whether you use analog, digital, CAN, whatever, to interface your LS powertrain into your JK, you're essentially still doing what we did eight years ago. You're using bi-directional controls to get the functionality that you want. We are striving to get this swap to be the easiest swap in a JK that you can do. And I feel that our new easy install is going to achieve that while also still offering the functionality that we have offered over the last eight years with cruise control, tap shift. The MoCAN module has 12 separate input outputs that it can be programmed for. So if you want to have external paddle shifters, let's say, it's going to be as simple as hooking a wire up to our MoCAN module, putting a signal into it, and the MoTeC module will process that. And you can use the paddle shifters on a steering wheel or a switch on the side of your console, whatever you want. Anything on the steering wheel to me, whether it's a cruise switch or paddles, gets confusing. If I'm out here in the desert and I'm spinning the wheel around, it gets confusing which way is up and which way is down. So I really like to have a fixed switch mount and we're going to offer several options for that. We're going to support bump shifters. It's a whole different level to use factory hardware, factory calibrations, factory power distribution, factory ground distribution, factory low reference. And I know a lot of you don't know exactly what I'm talking about, but just to keep it simple, let's say you had a factory power distribution box that had 15 circuits that were providing your engine with, uh, with power. Injectors, coils, throttle body, which has a couple of electric motors in it. You have low reference, which is basically ECM supplied ground. We run about seven ground distribution circuits in addition to the 15 power distribution circuits. And what's important here is that the ECM gets valid signals. Now most of these signals, at least the the sensitive signals like throttle position sensors and APPs, which is accelerator pedal position sensors, run on very low voltage. Zero to one O2 sensors in general run zero to one volt if they're not a powered O2. Most of the other critical sensors run zero to five volts. So it comes down to the millivolt and the milliamp. Your accelerator pedal position sensor has two independent sensors in it and they are accurate to within a millivolt. Inside the ECM is a TAC or a throttle actuator control module. It is monitoring not only the accelerator pedal position sensors but the throttle position sensors. These sensors work zero to five volts, five to zero volts. They are opposite of each other. They are synchronized by the throttle actuator control module and if they go out of sync even a couple of percent, bam, you go into reduced power. So what's critical is that we supply a proper low reference to these, to these sensors. Even if the low reference were to float a couple of tenths, which means maybe 100, 200 millivolts, that could kick you into reduced power. So if you're running one ground distribution wire for the entire engine performance system, and let's say you go under a load because you floor it, 
your throttle body slams open, your transmission downshifts so the solenoids are kicking on, there could be a voltage drop there that may affect ground distribution to the point that even if it doesn't cause you to go into reduced power mode, it could be affecting the performance of the system and you just don't know it. It could be that you have a slight amount of power reduced. It could be that your power is reduced 50%. It could be that you go to, de to a dead pedal, which is basically idle, or it could be that it kills the motor. So what's important is, is that you supply those signals, not only the low reference, but the power distribution to each one of these and keep those circuits independent. Because when a circuit is independent of another circuit, that means it's not affected by the load on the other circuit. If you were to put three loads on one circuit and one load were to have a high demand, that would affect the other circuits on or loads on that, on that circuit. Now, if you keep those independent, let's say you talk about the throttle position sensors. If you keep those independent, the low reference and the, and the power from the fuel tank pressure sensor, then the fuel tank pressure sensor, no matter what it does, even if it shorts out, is not going to affect the throttle position sensor. Now, believe it or not, in some operating systems in the old days, the FTP was hooked up to the same circuits as, as the throttle body, and it shorted out, bam, you were done. You weren't going anywhere. So we've learned that over the years, and GM has learned that over the years, and they've divided these, these signals, these circuits, power distribution and ground distribution in such a way that the critical circuits remain active, even in different failure modes. So that means you're not going to short out an FTP and, and the, you're going to lose, you're gonna lose uh, the engine. Um, they've divided this up. Now, if you start ganging these signals, if you start taking power distribution and ganging them together so that you can reduce the wire count, you start ganging the, the ground distribution together to make a simpler harness to build, you're going to start losing that functionality. You're going to start losing that redundancy. You're going to start losing those safeties. Now, in the old days, when we were running carburetors and points, wasn't that big of a deal because the carburetor didn't need any electronics. The coil just needed to get voltage to get saturated to fire the spark plugs. So pretty much, I could figure out and diagnose my way out of a situation. You got to look at these failure modes, you got to look at diagnostics, you got to look at emissions compliance, you have to look at the US EPA is demanding that the original hardware, now when I say original hardware, let's take an engine harness, that is the original hardware. And if we were to fabricate a harness from scratch, which we did for many years, we would have to duplicate that original harness to get the same level of functionality that the OE manufacturer had. We cannot just just build a harness and reduce 40 circuits out of it to save money because now we don't meet the OE manufacturer hardware requirement the US EPA requires. We are now using OE harnesses and it's the same thing as catalytic converters. In California you have to prove the origin of the exhaust system. The only way we can prove the origin of that exhaust system, it was approved by the feds for California, is to buy it from the manufacturer. Then there's no ambiguity. So we buy the exhaust system from the manufacturer, we install it in the vehicle, we show the referee or the lab the invoice, the part number, which then cross-references it to a California certified vehicle, and we're good. Same thing with an engine harness. It's going to get to that point. Now, if you get a hot rod harness, pretty much across the engine conversion world right now, whether it's a Hemi, where you put a 5.7 tune into a 3.6 or 3.8 PCM, whether it's a LS inside of a Chrysler operating system, where you basically hack and patch in LS parameters into a Hemi, operating system, whether it's an LS that is using a hot rod harness or a GM performance harness that's over the counter that does not support. There's a reason E-Rod engines do not meet OBD2 requirements. So let's talk about what's going to be incorporated into our new easy install kit. First are the billet brackets. We're going to billet brackets for several reasons. One, they look good. Two, the billet brackets are designed to be bolted on with no alignment required. The billet brackets are designed to put the accessories the JK accessories right back where they were, air conditioning pump, power steering pump, and alternator, so that your original wiring, power steering lines, and AC lines can be reused. This also means you can get these parts right over the counter from your dealership or an auto parts store. Second is our new Easy Hardware install. We've redesigned our hardware, and we designed our original hard hardware many, many years ago, and it has been copied and imitated by many. We're going to a new level now, making the hardware install easier so that there's no drilling, welding, cutting, grinding. All the fab work is gone. Third, Mocan. Mocan is a way of interfacing the Jeep and the GM CAN bus systems to eliminate 
using analog and digital signals. So our wire count is going to be significantly reduced. The MoCAN module is an aluminum case potted in epoxy and we use military grade components so we can run this MoCAN module under the hood. It's very small. It's about a half an inch thick, two by three inch. Guys, we are a shop full of ASC mechanics, master mechanics, G1 inspectors, G2 emissions inspectors. These guys live and breathe engine performance.